Uh, it's now time for our scripture reading. If we could all stand and let's read it as a congregation together, please. camp of Israel and called out, get up, the Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with churches inside. Watch me, he told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Amen. As a young, as a young person, I, I, I have three, three brothers and uh, one's just younger than me and and then there are two little ones. Well, they're not little anymore, but they were. And uh, we used to play a lot outside. <laughs> and uh, we would play Bible games. And, and this was one of our favorite. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Okay, so it wasn't exactly what the Bible said, but we would usually have swords in our hands. So we needed to you know, say something about the sword. So we are going to be looking at the story of Gideon, but I wanted to start, though, with the bad news. You know, there's news that comes from the Bible, and we think of it all as good news. And in fact, the uh, Greek word euangelion means the good news, and that's the good news about a new king that has been born, a new Caesar. No, I'm not going to sneeze. Okay. <laughs> That new Caesar was considered to be God. And so the runners through the Roman Empire would travel throughout the empire and they would, they would shout the good news that a new king had been born. So yes, that's the good news. But the bad news also is in the Bible. And that's, that's the Hosea text that, that we, you know, we often don't go past... Daniel, because that's a really great story, and so we stay with Daniel, and then we don't read a lot further into the minor prophets, but here we are today. So turn in your Bibles to Hosea, just the beginning part, and uh, hear, hear the word of the Lord today. Rebuke your mother. You ever thought that there would be that phrase in the Bible? Understand that this, this happening, this, this whole story is God trying to get a hold of the attention of his people. So you could use the big word in your mind right now, uh, and it is kind of an English word in the sense of an English class, metaphor. So, no, the Bible is not saying to us as children to rebuke our mothers. Boy, that would really be a good one to do on Mother's Day, right? No, 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 it wouldn't. This, this particular text is talking to Israel and saying your mother really you as a nation are to be rebuked rebuke her for she is not your wife quick context most of you know this but some may not Hosea is a prophet Hosea is asked by God to marry a not-so-good woman, or shall we say a woman with a not-so-good reputation. This woman does as she 
wants. And as a result, there are things that happen in that relationship that I'm going to say are very common today. If there is a strategy that the evil one has perpetrated upon the human race, it is this strategy. Destroy the family. Cause uh, desires for things that you don't have to well up inside of people inside a family and then cause those people to go after those desires so that they end up in relationships that end up destroying the relationship that they are in. Rebuke, rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife. The, the voice that you are hearing speak these words is God himself. And he is using Hosea's experience, which he has asked him to enter into as an example, as a metaphor of the relationship that he has with his own people, with his own wife. He's using Hosea and his relationship with his wife as a metaphor for the pain and the agony that is within his heart and now he is blurting out his feelings through the mouth of Hosea. For she is not my wife and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face. Can you hear the pain? Do you know people who have gone through this? Have you gone through this? Then if you know anything about what I'm talking about, even if it was in high school and somebody broke up with you that you loved because they wanted to be with someone else and you felt less than zero, can you feel that today? Because that's God talking in Hosea today and he is saying that's how I feel because you have chosen you have chosen someone else I will make her this is this is like very interesting I will make her like a desert turn into a perfect land and she and her day with them my friends, Hosea is in a very bad way. That's why I said it's bad news. He's in a bad way because he is being, he is being asked by God to uh, represent God in this equation. You might find it interesting that, that God is, is talking like this because he has entered into a husband-wife type relationship with his people. He, he would like to have that kind of intimacy. So I, you know, in my sermons, I, I try very hard to do both the NC-17 version and the G-rated version at the same time. So if you have ears, if you have older ears, you, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about intimacy in marriage. God is talking in those terms right now. He's talking about the intimacy that has been interrupted. And that she has gone her own way. And he, he is in pain. The good news comes a little bit later on in the chapter. The good news is that God has not given up. 
The good news is he is going to tell Hosea, you are not to give up either. I want you to go back and to get a hold of this, this wanton wife of yours and to bring her back into relationship with you and to have her as your wife again. Now, I don't know about you, but understanding this makes, makes me so happy because I have to admit that I am part of that wanton wife group. According to the prophet Isaiah, all we like, finish it for me, sheep, have what? Each one to... Okay, so if we include ourselves in that group of sheep in Isaiah, we have to include ourselves in the wife group in Hosea. And so it is really good news this morning that he tells Hosea, you have to go get her back. You have to go get her back. He tells her, he tells Hosea, you have to go get her back even if you don't want to. So you see why I'm choosing this particular scenario to remind us that if God has gone to all this trouble to have Hosea play out his feelings towards an Israel that has rejected him and has gone out and, and, and has prostituted herself with other Baals, that's what we read this morning, or other gods, And then he's told him, go get her back. Go love her anyway. Then that's the God that we say that we love. He's the God that we have been talking about this month. He has a system that he would like us to be part of. And in 2020, at the beginning of the year, I thought it would be good for us to look at the system that he operates in, and it's called love. That's God's system. That's his operating system. And so in the beginning, we said, God loves us generously. He's very generous. And then we said, God loves us faithfully. He doesn't give up on us. And we're seeing that again in Hosea. And then we said, God loves us hopefully. He hopes that we will love him back. And so I, I'm pushing the envelope. I, and I know I am. I'm pushing the envelope this morning by saying he also is saying to us in this text here in Hosea, love anyway, even if you don't want to. If you're my servant, Hosea, I'm asking you to go and get this wife of yours back and love her anyway. Because that's what I would do, God is saying. That's what, I, that's, what I, that's what I am doing. Because as you read this, you also note that it's a history book in some respects. It's Hosea saying, this is what was happening in my time. And it's God actually saying, I'm watching. And, 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 and you're, really, you know, you're really doing this to me, Israel, my wife, my people. You're really doing this to me. So I guess the first lesson today is God loves us anyway. I don't know about you. That's really good news. If you think about maybe some of the things that you did this week, if you think about some of the things that you thought this week and then you picture God 
through the Holy Spirit, knowing all of that, <laughs> maybe, maybe this is a moment when we can all rejoice. Yeah, we could do it privately, or you know, maybe there's some who'd want to jump up and say, Hallelujah! He loves me anyway! And we just know that you were ecstatic about the love of God for you even with everything that has gone wrong this week in your relationship. So that's the bad news. Aren't we glad that the bad news is so good? <laughs> that there is such a horrible story in the Bible. I mean, it goes on, you know, to detail the fact that this lady, Gomer, has three kids, none of whom are fathered by Hosea. And in between, she's gone from the family, and she's busy working for her pimp at the temple of the gods where she has been enslaved, and that he has had to go and buy her back multiple times, I, I'm just really glad that I don't have to be Hosea, and here's the good news, God isn't expecting me to be him. He's expecting me to be like him, which is really Point number two. Point number one today is God loves us anyway. Point number two is God calls us to do as he does. So if you've, if you've allowed this story to sink into your consciousness at all today, um, I'm wanting you to take those feelings now and I'm wanting, to, wanting you to wrap them in a call from that same God who loves you anyway. He is calling you now to love in the same way. Remember we've said generously, we've said uh, faithfully, we've said hopefully, and now we're saying love anyway. When I was telling Brett about this, he said, are you spelling that any space way? No. I'm spelling it A-N-Y-W-A-Y, anyway. Like, do it again. Do it over. Do it some more. God has chosen to love us every day this week. And he's basically saying, I want you to do like I do. And so the story, if you want to turn backwards in your Bible to Judges chapter 7, Judges chapter 7, we have this amazing story. And I, you know, I believe that God gives me little, little hints sometimes as to what might be handy to remind us all about, and this was one of those times when what popped into my head was the story of Gideon. And the phrase that we're going to work up to here is, do like I do. Gideon, at that very moment, has 300 guys that have a pot, a, a torch, and a trumpet in their hands. These are the 300 who are left over from over 29,000 men who showed up to his call to try and defeat the Midianites. And he took them through a, a series of tests, if you remember, because God said to do that. And in the end, all he had left that qualified, according not to him, but to God, to help him do what God was asking him to do, was 300. And they didn't even have swords. Because you see, if you read the story here where we are in chapter 7, you have Gideon going where God has sent him, which is to the edge of the camp. 
and at the edge of the camp of the Midianites, he hears one Midianite soldier talking to another about a dream that he had the previous night. Man, I don't know what I ate for supper, but I had this amazing dream. There was this huge big loaf of bread that rolled down through the camp. And we all got mashed, man. I'm gonna have to talk to the cook, this is terrible. And Gideon and his friend are hiding near this tent and they hear the story and Gideon knows that this is God talking to him and saying, this is gonna be you tomorrow night. Now he's gotta take, he's gotta take those those 300 guys and he's got to do this bread rolling. Now the harvest, this is very key because it's a symbol and, and I know that some of you like to go and dig and find out what symbols mean in the Bible. You know, Sabbath afternoon, you've had your nap and now you're bored and okay. So it's the barley harvest. And you say, what's interesting? Well. What harvest was it when Ruth met Boaz? Oh yeah, it was the barley harvest. Yes, go dig. Barley is significant. It's significant of redemption. Okay, put that in your Bibles, write it down. It's barley equals redemption. And then go look up in your concordance, go look up all the references in the Bible to barley. Very interesting. So you have the Midianites who would roll into town and they would steal everything, which is why, where did the angel find Gideon in the beginning of the story? In a wine press. Good thinking. The Midianites are not gonna be checking the wine presses. They didn't come for wine. They came for the barley harvest. They knew that the people had just finished harvesting the barley and that they could just roll into town and steal all their food, which they had been doing for years, by the way, and they could then ride off back into their homeland with a harvest that other people had harvested. I mean, from a military plan, from an economic plan, this was a pretty good idea for the Midianites because they lived in pretty arid places where you couldn't grow barley. They would just let other people do it and then they would steal it. So people had to devise some interesting ways of keeping them from getting what was theirs and what they needed for the next year. And that's why we find Gideon in a wine press threshing. Don't you love the, the, the Bible terminology because it brings up in the mind all kinds of actions that we have no knowledge of anymore. Um, you know, the, they didn't have combine harvesters, you know, which took two or three different actions and rolled them all into one machine and made John Deere and, 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 and a bunch of other big companies very famous and very wealthy. Harvesting threshing, winnowing. Remember the disciples, Jesus, they walk through the barley field. <laughs> There's another one. And they pick up a head of barley and they go like this. Uh-oh. Harvesting, threshing, <sighs> winnowing. And the Sabbath police got him, gave him a ticket. What are, you, what are you doing on the Sabbath? You're breaking the Sabbath? Because you were harvesting, threshing, and winnowing. So this is where we catch Gideon. And I'm, I'm just happy to tell you this piece of the story. The fact is that he was not really sure that the angel was from God. So he asked him to prove himself. So he makes a meal for him. Do you know how long that must have taken? And the angel waits. He doesn't, he, just sits, he doesn't look at his watch. He just waits quietly. And then he puts the meal before him. And then he pulls out his rod, his lightning rod, and touches the meal and poof, burns it to ashes. Like that was really what he was hoping to see happen, I guess, after he'd made that meal for him. 
And then he's still not sure, so he, he does the whole fleece thing. Dry one day, wet the next, because he gets it wrong. So he has to ask him again. Of course it's going to be wet. It's dew on it, right? So how do I know it was God? Oh, I've got to ask him tomorrow night, can you have the fleece be dry? Then I'll believe. So I don't know about your Christian walk today, my friends, but this story also gives me courage because this is a guy that, that God really wants to use in a mighty way to save his whole people, and he's really timid. So if, if you feel like God is calling you to a particular ministry uh, and, and you want to really know that it's God, guess what? It's okay to ask. It's okay. God is very patient with us. Because this is what Gideon does when he is now convinced that this is God who wants him to lead his people. He tears down the bales. B-A-A-L-S. And I, I, I cannot go past this, my friends, without saying that in this redemption story where we're hearing how God loves us anyway... And when he raises people up to tell others that he is going to save them, he asks them to be committed. To be committed to him and to show their commitment, they need to get rid of their other gods. So, I don't know what it is for you. I, I know what it is for me. But if you have other gods in your life today and you hear the voice of God saying I need you for my mission to your world I need you to be a Hosea I need you to be a Joshua if you're hearing that today in your heart then he needs you to know that you're gonna need to pull down the bales and this is what he does he takes his father's oxen and he takes the plow and burns it, and then he puts a rope around the altar of Baal, the statues of Ashtoreth, the sun and the moon gods, and he pulls them down. He destroys them. Well, what do you think? What do you think the community felt about that? Yeah, they hunted him down. They wanted to kill him for tearing down the false gods in their lives. Can you imagine? Has that taken shape at all in the modern day today? I can probably name two or three instances where that is possibly even going on within the Seventh-day Adventist church. You thought it would be, I'd say the Catholic church, right? Okay. Well, they, they've got their own problems. But we do too. We do too. And there may need to be some things that we get rid of in order to hear God's call more clearly and to show him we are serious about being his servants. The next day, he draws all of these people together by blowing the horn and saying, we're gathering together to go fight the Midianites. Do you want to come? And so this, this winnowing process happens that I told you about, and he ends up with 300. Now all the while, he's talking to God, and as the thousands are leaving, can you imagine? He's got a, a carpet as far as the eye can see of Midianites, and thousands of Israelites are now leaving. If you feel faint of heart, you, you know, go ahead and go home. 10,000. Okay, now I want you to, you know, God says you've got to go through the waters here and, and he's going he's gonna to watch you. And they walk through the waters. And only 300 walk through. And as they're walking, while they're watching. Yeah, I like military stuff. And uh, watch some of that. Let's put it this way, you don't get to be a seal if you stop, you kneel down, you put your weapons down, and you drink like a dog. 
you don't get to be on the team. Because the team is going to need vigilance. The team is going to need people who are laser focused on the mission. So, then they get to, then they get to go to war. And, and, and really, it, 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 was a, it was a rout. It, it was a complete disaster for the Midianites. A complete victory for God and the 300. The 300 who had no real weapons in their hands except the crashing of pottery which echoes around the hills, and then the raising of the torches in three strategic locations around the encampment, giving the impression that there is troops pouring in from three different directions simultaneously, and then the trumpet blowing, which is the sound of alarm for war, and God does everything else. Everything else he does. Yes, this is part of the tough part of the story in the sense that there is, yes, there is killing and there is dying and there is mayhem. This is, after all, a war story. But the Midianites are the ones who are doing the killing. They're killing each other. And I, I, I don't know about you, but increasingly, my dear wife and I, uh, when we hear stuff that's going on right now, where people are acting like this in other parts of the world, maybe even on TV in America or on our streets, we just say, you know, the, the, crazies, the crazies got them. The crazies got them. And that's what happened that night. That's what happened as the bread, the barley loaf that had been promised rolled through the Midianite camp and withdrew the Midianites from the lives of the Philistines. It was in that moment that Gideon becomes my hero for this particular reason and it's where the two stories match up. He had a moment to train those guys and, and, and all he said was, do like I do. Follow my example. And so, I'm just going to end with that today and say, Jesus is that Messiah. Jesus is that rescuer. Jesus is that person who is represented by the barley of redemption. And it is he that says to us today, love anyway. Because that's what I did. That's what I'm doing. And that's what I will always do because that's my character. And now that you are connected to me, now that you are, 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 are my people, now that we're back together as husband and wife, do like I do. Love anyway, even though it's hard. Amen.